on the beach, um, playing games of golf. But the harsh reality is that currently in South Africa, under 10% of South Africans can afford to retire comfortably. Sure, that's a startling figure. Now that's very scary <laughs> if you think about it. So why has government now embarked on referring or reforming the retirement landscape in South Africa? Was that necessary? If, you look at, if we look at our Funds at Work book, we see that you know, currently most members will only be able to get a replacement ratio. So that's the amount of income in retirement of 30% of what they got prior to retirement. Mm. So if somebody was earning 10,000 Rand just before retirement, when they retire, they'll only earn 3,000 Rand. And that's very difficult to live. Mm -hmm. So most of these members would then be forced to work after the retirement age, not out of choice, but out of necessity, or they'd be dependent on the state in terms of the state old age grant, or then depending on friends or family. And that's actually not what we want. And I think government has seen this problem, the industry has seen this problem, they look to try to address this and try to change the landscape so that more South Africans can retire more comfortably. So let's look at the, at the changes in a nutshell. What are some of the changes that are being proposed now by government? So just on a high level, some of the changes that we're looking at, at coming through will be a, a greater alignment between pension and provident funds. Um, we're seeing some tax changes as well. So the distinction between uh, non-pensionable income and pensionable income is set to fall away. And we're now going to look at total income as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the changes coming through. A lot, of a lot of effort is in place around what's termed as the Retail Distribution Review, yeah. or RDR. And that really focuses around costs. So what are the costs in the industry? More transparency around these costs, with the aim that eventually these costs will come down. So it makes retirement more accessible. And then another big change we're going to see in the industry is that around compulsory preservation. Mm -hmm. So we preserve where members, when they change jobs, won't be able to take their money as cash, as you preluded to earlier. Talk to me about that compulsory preservation because it seems there's some quite uh, uh, contentious issue that's currently being raised. Can you shed some light on, on the issue? Yes, I think it's, it's become quite contentious because there's a lot of misinformation that currently exists in the market. A lot of people believe that government's intention is to nationalise the pension savings, and that really not, isn't the case. Mm, okay. What is the case? So I think in order to understand why compulsory preservation has come into effect, let's take a step back and look at the importance around preservation. We see South Africans on average change jobs every five years. So that means every five years, members are faced with a decision of what to do with their retirement savings. Mm. Unfortunately, most South Africans you know, make a bad choice. And they take that money, they go and buy a new car, they go on a holiday, and they don't save that money towards their retirement. So that means that every time they again start their new job, they're starting from zero again. Mm -hmm. And let's just you know, show an example as to how, how detrimental this is for your retirement. That if somebody has been contributing 12% of their salary you know, throughout their life, and at the age of 45, if they change jobs, and, and someone opts to take that money as, as cash and spends that money, if they were then were to retire at the age of 65, their pension would only be one third of what it could have been had they continued. Huh. So this is a major contributing factor as to why most South Africans can't actually retire. So with that in mind, government has set some proposals to make preservation compulsory. This is sort of set to come in sometime after 2016. Mm -hmm. So it's not, in, no, it's not in law now. But when this legislation comes in, it's quite important to note that your, your current retirement savings, those won't be affected. You can still have access to those if you need to. What is the percentage of access to that savings? So you'd still have as it is currently. Okay. So you still have the full amount. It's only future contributions from then onwards that would be affected by this. So it's really the intention is not to go national savings. And we're seeing a lot of people with, with all this noise resigning from their jobs to reapply just to get hold of this. This really isn't the right thing to do because it's a big tax burden and it's often that money isn't then saved towards retirement. It's been spent. So we want to try and avoid that. Now, the charge or the change rather in the taxation of retirement benefits has seen many people saying that this will signal the end of the umbrella funds. Uh, do you believe that that is the case? No, not at all. I don't mm. think, I think, you know, with, especially with the retail distribution review coming into effect, you're going to see umbrella funds increase in prominence. Mm. And that's because we need to bring costs down. And the only way to do that is to then look at economies of scale. So great amounts of people into an umbrella fund, that's, a way, that's one way in which you can save for retirement in a cost-effective manner. I do think that with the change, there would be some employers where an umbrella fund may not be the right case. Mm -hmm. For them, there would be a group retirement annuity. So it isn't really a one-size-fits-all, but it's really looking at what's the best solution for particular clients. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it becomes quite important because umbrella funds do have some advantages over group retirement annuities. If you look at accessibility, um, typically an umbrella fund have a minimum contribution amount around about 200 rand. On a group retirement annuity, that isn't the case. Most of them have fairly high minimum investment amounts, often 1,000 Rand. Some have reduced that to 500 Rand. And that becomes really you know, very difficult for lower earning members to be able to contribute that amount towards their retirement. Just, just explain briefly the concept of an umbrella fund. So umbrella fund basically is where you have many different employers who don't have a standalone pension fund. 
they then form part of this umbrella, okay, mm -hmm. where they all participate in one fund, and they can then get the retirement benefits in that fund and the risk benefits in that type of fund. So it really is a way in which we can you know, group people together with the aim of bringing those costs down and giving them the right type of benefits to meet their needs. Now, Yusuf, we don't have much time, but what okay. sort of advice would you give to people right now sitting there at the age of maybe 50, 60 and going to retire? And uh, what sort of advice would you give them? I think if you look now, there's a lot of noise in the industry. Um, there's a lot of noise out around the bribe. People are saying lots of things. It's very important just to take a step back mm -hmm. to understand what your options are. You know, with all the changes coming on in the industry, it's important that members don't lose focus of their goal, and that's to save, be able to retire comfortably. Mm -hmm. so, it does, so keep the contribution rates high, keep your pensionable salary up, and continue saving towards retirement. And that's really important. With the moves around compulsory preservation, please don't go in and resign, only to reapply to get hold of your, your retirement savings. That's not the wisest thing to do, and that will severely impact your chances of being able to retire comfortably. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, as an employer or as a member, whenever you're faced with any choice, really consider all the options and look at these holistically. You know, go and seek qualified financial advice with somebody who knows what they're doing so that you can really find the best solution that meets your needs for your specific needs. I think that's quite important. Now, some people might say, you know, I can retire from my job and take my funds and put it into my own retirement fund, and I will probably get a little bit more. Is, is that the case or not? I think if you just go back and say, you know, where do they put their funds? When most people take those funds out, when they leave their jobs, okay. Is there a higher interest on private uh, retirement funds or not? It depends on the investment option that has been mm -hmm. selected. So it's very difficult to say that, you know, where would you get the right, the right return? Mm -hmm. But I think the important thing then for people is to then continue saving that to retirement. What we actually see is that most people don't. They take that money as cash, in which case then they'd be taxed on that. So that's a big tax burden that you don't need to pay. And then that money sits in the bank account for a while, and before they know it, they've used that to go and you know, redo some of their house, and that money goes away very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think whenever money's in a bank account, it gets depleted quite quickly, and that's actually one of the worst things that you can do for your retirement, mm -hmm. because that means that you, it's going to take you a lot of time with a lot of contributions trying to make up that lost amount. Yusuf, thank you so much for the overview there. Yusuf Nanabai, he's the head of product development at Momentum Employees Fund. Thank you so much for joining us here thank on AM News.